And now, now, it's time for your Low Country Real Estate Market Update. Good morning, Charleston, and welcome to another edition of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. I'm, of course, your host, Brian Beatty. Thanks for joining me this morning. We're going to talk about the state of the market and a few other things, of course, real estate related. This is your show to get all information on what's happening in the market, trends within it, and then the process, right? I help educate you guys on how people buy and sell real estate in the most cost-effective manner possible, right? For me, it's all about how can I position my clients to make the most money possible on their real estate transaction. Some folks look at it as saving money. I look at it as making money. Obviously, real estate is one of, if not your biggest asset. So it makes sense uh, to spend a lot of time preparing, educating yourself on not just the market and, and what it is you're looking to accomplish specifically, but how to do it. So appreciate you guys joining me this morning. There was an article that came out from Post and Courier uh, a little bit ago that said that Charleston home sales have dropped two and a half times faster than the market average or or the national real estate market average. And what happened, right? And so it's a very catchy title. And I understand it. You know, I mean, it's a generalist and, and I certainly do that from time to time on this show with regard to picking a specific data point and then adding context which I think this article did a good job of doing because based on those that were interviewed, they essentially said, look, it's just a blip on the radar. You know, some months are worse than others, uh, but you're not going to use one month's worth of stats to change the trajectory of a market. We need several months in a row to really call it a trend. And so in reality, you know, our home sales, uh, the, the number of closings in September dropped 10.9% for that month compared to the last month, I'm sorry, to the last September of last year, whereas the market for for the national real estate market only dropped 4.2%. So they're saying it's, you know, look, Charleston home sales are dropping two and a half times faster than the US average. What does that mean for our market? And I think the reality is it doesn't really mean anything for our market. If you, if you really think about September closings, those were contracts that were written in July and August. And those were just slow months for us. You know, we had a lot of people that were waiting around, anticipating a rate cut, waiting for interest rates to drop. Uh, and when that happened, it was a nice spur of activity. But you also have a lot of people that are just waiting on the results of the election, right? They don't have to move. There are a ton of people in this market right now that would like to move, they'd like to buy, they'd like to sell, either they can't find what they're looking for or they just aren't motivated enough to sell their home and buy another and leave behind that really attractive two and a half, three, four percent interest rate that you just can't get right now unless you negotiate with the seller to try and buy down the interest rate, which you can do, which we do for a lot of folks and it works really well. Uh, People that are just payment conscious. But, you know, I think the other thing that that isn't really taken into account at times in our specific market, because we know that everybody's moving here, right? And why not? Charleston's an amazing place. And there's certainly no shortage of, you know, accolades online for for Charleston uh, in, in terms of, gosh, being ranked the number one travel destination in the world. I don't know how many times at this point, but several Um, you know, but it seems like we're always in the top 10. Same thing with retirement and tourism in general. It's just we attract a lot of people for a variety of reasons. But one thing that I certainly didn't take into account as a reason or a motivator for somebody to move over these past few years has been the current administration's god-awful immigration policy. Because we have folks that are moving from areas that have been flooded to Charleston, I mean, California, New York, Chicago, plenty of other places in between. A lot of folks in those areas are saying, you know, that I'm, I'm out of here. I don't want to live in this area anymore or this type of environment anymore. Or maybe the politics of the area that they're living in now has become so overwhelmingly ridiculous and so far left that they're, they're moving because they just can't stand it anymore. And these are things that I am hearing from folks on almost a daily basis as I'm having conversations with them about moving here, selling their home, buying another, working out the logistics of a cross-country move. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of steps involved, right? But I think a lot of 
folks have uh, immigration has caused people to move and they're moving here right they want to be in a coastal area i mean you think about new york as an example you know in new york the median rent for a one bedroom apartment across all five major boroughs is like $3300 a month um for a one bedroom apartment it might even be like a studio apartment uh because we all know how incredibly expensive real estate in uh, New York is. You have to basically make $150,000 a year to rent an apartment in the Bronx. So a lot of people are just so overwhelmed with that sticker shock. And then on top of that, the politics associated with that area, they're, they're moving to Charleston, South Carolina, right? And of course, it's not just our area, but we get a lot of inbound traffic from those regions for a variety of reasons. And the reality is their real estate is more expensive than ours. So, of course, it's going to impact the higher end of the market. What we have not really gotten a good grip on is addressing this issue of low inventory. Now, I mean, in our market, inventory has gotten um, a little better, right? Year to date, we've put about 14% more properties on the market than we did this time last year. We've put almost 19,000 properties on the market as of the end of September, Whereas this time last year, uh, it was a little over 16,000. So it, there's been a nice improvement in inventory. Um, and, you know, we're, we're putting about the same amount of homes under contract year to date, about 2% more than we did, did last year. Closings are just a little bit down, but you know, that stat that I was telling you how, uh, you know, Post and Courier kind of plucked that one stat and then made a story around it where uh, our closings in September were two and a half times lower than the U.S. average. Well, year to date, we're only down negative 0.2%. We're basically in line with closings for last year. We just had an off month, right? And what's happened with month supply of inventory, which is you for, for and I know I've explained this several times, but you basically take the total amount of properties that are available for sale at any given point in time, and you divide that by the number of homes that are going under contract on a monthly basis. That gives you month supply of inventory, which is what we use to measure the health of a real estate market, right? Is it a buyer's market, seller's market, normal market? What can we expect with regard to prices, days on market, so on and so forth? And right now we're still in a seller's market, but uh, we've seen a 32% increase in month supply of inventory. So it's starting to trend more toward the buyer's direction, more toward a normal market, but still very much so a seller's market. It's just that Sellers are having a tough time right now getting the price that they think their house deserves. And so I'm going to talk uh, next about what's your house worth? You know, how do we approach that process appropriately? And then what are some things that we have to take into consideration? Because even if you put three homes that are the exact same, literal exact same home right next to each other, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that's willing to pay the exact same price three times in a row. It's just not really the way real estate works. But we're going to talk about what your home is worth and how we analyze that. What's the proper way to analyze that um, when we come back. But, you know, it, just to kind of wrap this up, our market's still doing just fine. It's just a little slow right now. And we've got some pretty important distractions, right, that we need to figure out what in the world's going to happen. Are we going with option A or option B? Um, you know, are we looking at a $25,000 down payment assistance program or are we looking at tax cuts, tax hikes? What's going to happen with capital gains? There's a lot of questions that impact your decision-making process as it relates to buying and selling real estate. And I get that. Um, what I will say, however, is that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. We can find a way to accomplish your goal so long as we feel the market can bear it. So uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about how to, how to in, in, evaluate the, the value of your home, right? How do we determine what's that, what that's worth? Uh, so stick around. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. Uh, and I will just say really quickly that a lot of the folks that listen to this show uh, ask for just updated information from me on what's going on in their specific market, because every market's different, right? We can talk about generalized stats for the market in Charleston, but Charleston's a very diverse market. Right? We've got all different types of properties and all different types of price ranges. So yeah, we can average it all out and give you a general idea of the trend and direction of the market. But if you want to know what's happening in your specific area, your neighborhood, you want to get set up to start looking at some 
homes that are sent to you online. Maybe you want access to properties that are not online. They're not publicly available. We call those off-market properties or shadow inventory. If you want to get your hands on that, uh, then reach out to me. We can have a discussion. I can just send you some information. We can talk in depth about uh, what you're looking to accomplish, or I can just do you the favor of getting you set up on a search. Either way, give me a buzz or text. The number is 843-800-0065, 843-800-0065, or check us out online at listingsincharleston.com. So I want to talk now about how to determine what the house is worth, right? We, we go on all these appointments. We've got all these folks that are saying this, that, and the other about what they think their home is worth, what other online sources have told them their home is worth, what the opinion of other real estate agents have been. And it's always a moving target. It's, you know, there's no one way to determine exactly what your home is worth because you have to think about it from a few different perspectives. And, you know, there are a lot of folks, like I mentioned in the last segment, that just want updated, accurate information on what's happening in the real estate market or what the value of their home actually is. And the best, and I mean, really the most accurate way of doing it is for allowing us to walk through the house five, 10 minutes max. Um, let us put our eyes on the property. Let us assess the condition and the upgrades. And then, you know, it takes 15 minutes to determine what the, the property is worth. Obviously, I've been doing this for a long time. I've done this God knows how many times, tens of thousands of times. Um, so you get pretty good at determining what the, the market will bear for a house. But we have to first understand that uh, there's a few different points of view here, right? The first is how much the seller is willing to sell a property for, right? Just because a house might be worth a certain amount doesn't mean that that's what the seller is going to agree to let the property go for. The second is how much a buyer is willing to pay, right? And if you have a seller that's unwilling to accept what a buyer is willing to pay, then we don't have a deal. The third is what you can prove through data right? So that's when we took a look at comps, we make adjustments, we, we look at several properties and we do our analysis. And so I want to dive into that just a little bit. Um, but wanted to say first that, you know, the, the challenge is it has become so convenient, almost too convenient for people to think that they're getting an accurate opinion on the value of their home through all of these online est estimators, right? I'll pick on Zestimate uh, for, for just a moment. If you really dig into the fine print of Zillow's Zestimate, they will tell you that their standard deviation, right, on top of the percentage accuracy that they quote unquote promise could mean that you're like, plus or minus 20% of what the value actually is. And if you look at the, the model in, I think, greater detail or from a slightly different point of view, think about all the money that Zillow lost by buying properties and then selling them at prices that just didn't match up. They lost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and proved that their estimate essentially is not reliable. I mean, the owner of, I think, Zillow, the CEO of Zillow, when he sold his home a few years ago, uh, ended up selling it for like significantly less than what Zillow thought, thought it was worth. I'd have to look up the story. But the point is, online valuation tools will always be flawed. They will never be accurate. And the reason why is because they know nothing about the condition of your home or the upgrades within your home and the value that the market for that specific area and price range places on those things. It also doesn't take into account concessions or repairs or a seller paying a buyer's closing costs or a seller buying down the interest rate for the buyer. All these things matter because that can be 10, 20, 30, $50,000 in extras or incentives or concessions that that tool did not take into account. Like in other words, if you're going to sell a house in Somerville for half a million dollars and you see that comps are coming in at around half a million dollars, you're going to think your home's worth around half a million dollars. But then when you dig into the comps, you realize, wait a minute, all of these sellers have paid the buyer's closing costs that have cost, you know, $12,000 on average. So they're not selling for 500, they're selling for 488. And then sellers get shocked or surprised when 
the market doesn't bear uh, that price for their property because it's a it's a finicky market right now. Even though we still have fairly low inventory, and even though we're still in a seller's market, demand overall, kind of in comparison to the past few years, has been pretty low, right? And that's because of things like people having a three percent mortgage and not wanting to move, or just simply not being able to afford to move, right? Afford to buy. They can't save up enough for the down payment. And even though interest rates are at about 6% right now, they still can't afford it. There's a lot of people in that position right now. Um, But again, I think there are just as many, if not more, that would move if it made more financial sense. Because that's the thing is, you know, you you have all these folks that just quick tangent here, but if you think about little, little moments in time over the past, say, decade or so, maybe even further back, maybe 15 years, there have been financial incentives to move whether it was the $8,000 first time home buyer tax credit back in 2009, I think uh, is when that was 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, Or you have interest rates that dropped drastically, right? Went down to 3% below 3%. I mean, that's, I remember very clearly being on this program and telling people that you're about to get into a, a serious, you know, fight with a bunch of buyers to try and win this house, just understand that you're probably not going to win against the seller. You're not going to beat up a seller on their price. Who you're going to win against is the bank. And you're going to lock in for the next 30 years an interest rate at like 2.75%. You will be very happy with that because now you've taken that property. And as you build equity, as so many folks did over the past several years, I mean, if you look at, you know, just year to date in Charleston, our median sales price uh, is up 4%, $420,000. So you have all these folks that have really low interest rates and a lot of equity. They're going to pull out that equity and they're going to buy another property and hopefully they're going to keep the one that they bought with the 2.75% interest rate and they're going to turn that into a rental because that would be the smart thing to do unless you really need the equity and you just want to spend it all on the next house or you know, diversify that, that equity into other things. But, um, that's been kind of the story over the past decade or so, maybe a little bit more is that there have been these moments in time where we create these big surges in activity because it just makes sense to do so. You know, the, the, the thought that was going through a lot of folks mind over the past several years, you know, maybe up until 2022 was, you know, why not? Why not move to a different part of the country? If I don't have to be in the office from nine to five anymore, why not sell our house and buy another? Because not only do we have equity, but by the time we buy something else, it'll have an even lower interest rate and we can buy a bigger, better home for basically the same price as what we're paying now. It just made a lot of sense. Well, obviously then the interest rates got jacked up and you know it just didn't make financial sense for a lot of people. It's still for a lot of folks, real estate's just unaffordable. So you know, back to the idea of how do we then determine how much someone's willing to pay for a home, how much a seller's willing to sell a home for, and then how can we prove or justify that that property is worth what the buyer is paying and what the seller has agreed to sell it for in the eyes of the bank, right? Because a lot of properties have mortgages. So we have to make sure the bank feels good about the value of the property, and that's done through an appraisal. And that's why You know, you can have a buyer and a seller agree to a certain price, but if that buyer's getting a mortgage and the bank says otherwise through an appraisal, they say, hey, sorry, it's not worth that, it's worth this, then the buyer is forced with either bringing cash to the table or the seller's forced to sell the property for less or put it back on the market and try and find somebody else. And there's a lot more that I can go into in that regard, but when we're looking at properties and we're determining the value of the property, we have to look at it from a few different perspectives. One is what's happening in that area, right? Right. What is the market like for properties in that price range, in that location? Is it a seller's market? Is it a balanced market? Is it a normal, you know, market, buyer's market? What's the typical, you know, negotiability that uh, buyers get when they purchase properties in this area? How how far off the asking price, original asking price, uh, did sellers have to go in order to sell their house? Um, you know, other dynamics that that we look at just in terms of market trends. But then, of course, we start looking at your specific property and we compare it to others that are on the market under contract sold and those that have not sold, right? Because we're starting to see more and more expired and withdrawn and canceled listings hit the market 
basically folks that failed to sell. Uh, and so we take all this data and then we, we start putting your property up against these other homes, just like an appraiser would. What, what the mistake that so many people make, whether they're an agent or a seller, uh, well, first of all, is just relying on a home evaluation tool online. It's, they're just not accurate uh, for reasons previously discussed. The second would be just taking a list of properties in a neighborhood that are somewhat similar and then looking at price per square foot and saying, well, the average price per square foot is $350. And so that's about what your property is worth. How motivated are you to sell? You know, we can toggle it from there based on your motivation. That really, you know, that's not the proper way to identify value for real estate, right? We need to understand, again, your condition, your upgrades, the quality of your improvements, the age of your major systems, and then what your home has that other homes don't have and vice versa so that we can make adjustments for that. You know, if you have a three-car garage, but your comps have a two-car garage, you should get more money. If you have a fence and they don't, you should get more money. Screen porch. I mean, all of these different things are, are weighed in to determine value for real estate. And, the, and I think a lot of folks have not either been trained properly on this or they just take the easy option, which is going the price per square foot route. But if you really want to know what your property's worth, you either have to have an agent come by and, and take a look at it in person or send us like photos or video or whatever. Uh, we can do it that way too. Uh, and then for us to make individual adjustments to the other comparable properties so that we can then determine how much your specific property is worth on paper, right? That's what, it's, that's what it should sell for. But a lot of sellers are finding right now that they're not getting the price that they thought they would get because the market has softened. So just because it might be worth something on paper doesn't necessarily mean that's what a buyer is willing to pay for it, right? Just like that might not be what you're willing to sell it for. And so maybe you have uh, an impasse, maybe one person, uh, you know, comes slightly further to, to the other side of the table to make a deal work. Um, but, but I think a lot of sellers right now are still pretty stubborn on their price. I think a lot of buyers are still willing to pay it or very close to it. Um, but I do see the, you know, the, the foundation starting to get a little shaky, right? We've, we've been in a seller's market for 10 years. At some point in time, we've got to transition into a normal market. Otherwise, everything's going to be worth at least a million bucks and no one's going to be able to afford real estate, right? Prices can't continue to go up at the levels they have. It just creates unsustainability. All right, stick around, folks. We've got a lot more to talk about right here on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. If you want to reach out to me, you want to have a chat about real estate, you're thinking of buying, selling, investing. Maybe you have some properties you'd like for us to manage for you through our property management company. Uh, give us a call. We'd love, to, we'd love to help in any way we can. You know, I've been selling real estate for 20 years. I've done about 1,500 transactions, about a billion dollars worth of real estate total. So um, happy to help in any way I can. 843-800-0065 is the number. 843-800-0065. Or check us out online, listingsincharleston.com. I always like to take a moment and just say thank you to those of you that listen to this program and 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 just rely on the information within it to help shape your understanding of the real estate market. Uh, I always appreciate those of you that that call and either ask uh, you know general knowledge questions or of course that give us the opportunity to earn your business. Uh, and so thank you to the, all of you that uh, have have treated us so well. Um, and thanks for listening to the show. So I want to talk a bit about um, just the process of of selling a house and buying another. We. Even though we talk about this on this program somewhat often, uh, it's just such a main point of stress for folks that I think it's best for me to just really quickly go over your options again. Because going outside of the box on this, you know, as opposed to here's what most people do, right? They, they say, look, I need to sell my house before I buy another. I can't just go and sell my house, I'd have nowhere to live. So I need to find another property that I want to buy first. And then try and make them an offer with the caveat that, hey, I need to sell my house in order to afford to buy yours. So yeah, you're going to take my offer and then I'm going to put my property on the market. I'm going to market it. I'm going to accept a contract. I'm going to get through all of the you know, inspections and appraisal and so on and so forth. And then when all that's done, then I can buy your house. It's not a very attractive offer to a seller. Now, over the past few years, these have been pretty hard to pull off because it's been such a seller's market, right? You're asking that seller to give you extra time to maybe hopefully buy their house if you can sell yours first rather than 
what do what most sellers have done over the past few years is basically use that offer from you as leverage to go and get other better offers from other buyers. There was a real problem and still is to an extent. It's it's either agent specific or it's just a trend that was in the market where when you made an offer, sorry, we're not touching that offer for a few days, right? Very frustrating for buyers, especially those that say, hey, I'm paying you exactly what you want me to pay. Why haven't you accepted my offer? The challenge with doing a home sale contingency, right? Where you find a property that you like, you make an offer to the seller and you say, hey, I'll buy your property, but I have to list and market and sell my home first before I can buy it. Again, it's not a very attractive offer to that seller. So what are some of the alternatives? What are some different ways of approaching this process? Because if you just go with the traditional, you know, I make an offer on a house, it's contingent upon me selling my house, that seller is probably going to beat you up on price and terms, right? They're not going to give you uh, the deal of the year and also give you all this time to maybe be able to buy their house, right? So here, you know, I typically see things like um, a larger termination fee, right? Because when you make an offer to a, a seller, you have a certain amount of time to conduct your due diligence, right? You do your inspections, you renegotiate based on your findings, um, you proceed as is, or you terminate the contract and you give the seller some money and you say, hey, sorry, it didn't work out. Um, better luck next time. So um, they're probably going to ask for a higher termination fee. They're probably not going to negotiate very much on the price. They might make some portion or all of your earnest money non-refundable. They might make you reduce your price at certain intervals if uh, your home stays on the market. Uh, if another offer is received from a buyer that does not have a home to sell, then they can kick you out of the process. It's called a kickout clause. So the seller has a lot of power. And, you know, for the folks that are listening that, you know, I, we talked to several sellers that are like, hey, I don't want a home sale contingency. And we talk about it. And I, I say, that's fine if that's uh, the route that you want to go. But I just would like to understand why, uh, because, you know, we can do things a bunch of different ways. And after talking through it, most folks are open to it. But as somebody that would represent a seller, I'm going to be very strict with that buyer that needs to sell their house with regard to deadlines, uh, with regard to the money that they are going to invest, that the seller is going to be able to keep no matter what at little stops along the way. Because again, you're asking us to give you uh, the benefit of the doubt here. We're going to have to hope that your home closes so that you can buy ours. If not, it impedes our ability to move to the next step. And if a seller has a home that they want to buy and they need to sell, then you create this domino effect and that can get messy. So again, not the end of the world if that's the way you want to do it, but here are a few other options. Not all are going to be attracted, by the way, but I'm just going to lay them all out. I'm not necessarily putting favoritism on one or the other, but here they are. One is you just sell your house and then you rent back from the buyer. Another option is you sell your house and you go and you find another rental, maybe a short-term rental, uh, maybe something that's like a corporate rental if you're moving to another area and you haven't found what you're looking for yet, but you have to be there, right? Probably not a bad idea to really familiarize yourself with that area you're moving to anyways, because unfortunately, we sell a lot of homes from folks that moved here that just didn't understand that particular area. They didn't really know what they were getting themselves into and they're like, yeah, we don't like this area. <laughs> We're moving somewhere else. Um, so you've got, you can sell the property and the buyer can rent it back from you, which, you know, if you are trying to buy another property and you have to sell your home first, that might be a great option, right? Because you get your money and then you can go ahead and purchase that other property. Maybe it's you purchase it for cash um, and you have time to do that um, because the buyer is going to rent allow you to rent your own house back from them. Another option is uh, instead of a home sale contingency, right? Where you go to a seller and you say, hey, I, I want to buy your house, but I have to sell mine first. What you could do is the reverse of that. You could do a home purchase contingency. And I've talked about this a few times on this program. And still, even though you know, I know agents listen to this program too. No, I don't see it. I just don't see people using this option. It just boggles my mind because I think it's a really good one. But uh, a home purchase contingency, right? So you can put your home up for sale, not knowing where you're going to go next. 
and have a contingency that says, hey, I will market my home for sale and I can even accept an offer. However, I'm, I need a certain period of time, whether that's two weeks, 30 days, three months, to find a, another property to put under contract and not just put it under contract, but inspect it and get the appraisal done so that I know that once I get through those things, it's pretty much a done deal. Um, so if I can't find a property within that period of time, or if I go under contract with a home to buy and that deal falls through, I still have enough time to cancel the sale on my house so that I don't wind up homeless. All right, so you list your property for sale with the caveat that, hey, if I'm gonna take your offer, I need X amount of time to find a replacement property. And if I can't, then I get to terminate this contract at no cost. It's a fantastic option. Another option, a little more costly, well, potentially a lot more costly, but there are companies out there that will basically buy a house for you and then you rent it from them until you're ready to buy it from this company. So th here's, here's the scenario, right? You find a house that you really like and you weren't really expecting to move, but you know, you saw this great house and you're like, gosh, that's just perfect. Let's do this. You go to the seller and the seller says, hey, I'm not really interested in a home sale contingency. You know, you guys haven't done anything to prep your home for, for sale. Uh, you haven't met with a real estate agent. You don't know how much it's worth. We don't know how long it's going to take to sell. There's a lot of risk there. I'm not interested in taking a home sale contingency offer. Well, what you could do if you really want the house is you could basically make an offer for cash because the company will pay cash for the property. They're going to charge you about 2% of the purchase price in order to create this convenience for you. And then you're going to have to rent that property from them until you sell your home and then buy the property from that company. The beauty in this is that you can, you know, like you've seen some billboards probably and some of these incentives from agents that are like upgrade your offer to cash. Well, really what they're saying is that through the help of a company and for a fee, they will buy the property for you. And then as soon as your home sells, you just buy it from them. But the beauty is you could list your home for sale, not include a home sale contingency, use this company to promise to pay cash and then just try and sell your home before you have to buy the house that you're under contract on. Because then you don't have to use the, the cash, right? You can use it from your home sale. So that's just another way of doing it. Um, you know, of course, there are also things like lease to purchase or subject to or loan assumptions. There's a few other ways of incorporating even more confusion <laughs> into this process, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Those are some additional ways for you to approach the process of buying another home and selling yours at the same time. So if that's something you want to strategize on, there's no one size fits all approach to this. Everybody's a little different in terms of their propensity for risk, the timelines, how much they need from the sale. All of those important factors need to be discussed and, and taken into consideration. So if that's something you guys want to talk about, first of all, I will say that a lot of this is spelled out in the guide that I wrote, which is the most comprehensive home seller guide in Charleston. There's, I still haven't seen anything like it. And I appreciate all of you that have gotten your copy. If you're a listener and you haven't gotten a copy yet, it's just, I think it's a good read because it educates you on just the process of selling a house. Uh, and of course it has current market trends within it. But if you want to get a copy of that guide, text the word guide to 843-800-0065. Text the word guide to 843-800-0065. And I will send you about a 50 page copy of the most comprehensive home seller guide in Charleston. Again, if you want to reach out to me personally and talk more about that, that same number that you're going to text, you can also call and chat directly with me. It comes straight to me. Um, or check us out online, listingsincharleston.com, or you can send me an email, uh, brian at brianbeattyteam.com. Uh, I want to finish the, the discussion today uh, talking a little bit about investment real estate because we're starting to see some more opportunities come across our desk for folks that are open to selling at what I would say are investor prices. Now, you're going to have a, a range here, and it's going to depend on what type of investor is going to purchase the property because if you're a wholesaler or a flipper or buying it as a, a renter uh, or buying it to rent it out, um, maybe you're buying land to improve it. 
uh, or develop it. There's a, a few different kind of market understood percentages that kind of need to fall into place in order for that to be a worthwhile investment, right? In order for that investment to, you know, to, to pencil on paper. Now, so again, we're, see- we're seeing more opportunities from folks that just are, they're in tough situations. They need to sell and uh, they need to sell now. So of course, speed from an investor's perspective is also very important, but not everybody is able to sell really quickly. Sometimes there are legal issues or judgments or liens um, or other parties to the transaction that are tough to reach. I mean, there's a lot that goes into this, but um, we, I'm, I'm on my, uh, we, we just picked up another property. I just picked up one personally to, to flip in Somerville. We just finished one. We did, we, we, I bought a property for 275. I put 125 into it. I sold it for 500. It was a nice little payday. Um, but the nice thing is, is that that $125,000 renovation, which is, that's a lot of money. There's a lot that went into spending that money in that house. From the time we started that project until the time that project was done was six weeks. We were on the market for two weeks, sold it in 30 days. From start to finish, that project took 89 days. Got another one that we just bought and uh, it needs basics, paint, carpet, some repairs. That'll be done in a week and I'll go on the market. The goal on that one is from purchase to sale is 60 days. Now it doesn't always work out like that, but um, you know there are more, op- the point is, is there are more opportunities. So if you're thinking of investing in real estate, you look for, I think, moments in time where there's maybe a little chaos, right? Because where there's chaos, there's opportunity. I, I'm not saying that in terms of preying on the unfortunate. It's just that there are more folks right now that are willing to sell at investor prices. And if you want to get in on that, um, you know, let me know. But we're going to have to have a frank conversation about, you know, what you deem to be a, what I call a green light investment. In other words, whatever the amount of money is that you want to invest in real estate, we need to have a very clear understanding of how you want that money to perform, right? What is your required rate of return in order to invest in whatever, you know, asset you want to invest in? And, And by the way, is this a flip? Is this a buy and hold? Are we just looking to wholesale the deal, right? Where you tie it up and then you just sell the rights to the contract to somebody else for a fee? You have to get it for a really good deal in order to be able to do that. But, um, you know, again, all these different investment types have generally understood percentages. Like if you're going to flip something, there's the 70% rule, right? The 70% rule says that whatever the after renovation value of that property is. Let's say it's half a million dollars, but it's going to cost um, $100,000 to make it a half a million dollar property, right? So you take $500,000, you deduct the amount that you need to spend in order to get it to that value. So that's $400,000. And then you take 70% of that number, right? So that would be what? $280,000, right? So you're buying it for two hundred and eighty. dollars you're putting a hundred in, you're selling it for 500, which is almost exactly how that deal worked out that I just did in Somerville. So 70% rule, it works out really well. Um, you know, if you're going to buy a property as a rental right now, I, I think that prices are still pretty inflated. You're only going to make money on a rental if you buy it right, or if you improve the property. Um, and, and I, you know, there are plenty of options there as well. Uh, especially in multifamily where some of the uh, returns start to get a little juicier. So if that's something you're interested in, we also have a property management company that is very closely tied to the investor pool that we work with because if they're going to buy something to rent it out, we need to know how much it's going to rent for realistically, right? The the problem is, uh, especially agents that work with investors, and I'm I'm sorry to have to say this, but it's just true. And it, it, it used to be true for me when I didn't, understand um, not only the, the the game, but how much things cost. And, you know, you fast forward to now where I've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on renovating real estate and buying real estate. I know how much things cost, which also helps me determine what things are worth, right? Uh, but the two biggest mistakes that people make are underestimating how much it's going to cost 
to renovate the property or just to acquire and hold it. And they overestimate either how much they can sell it for or how much they can rent it for, right? So we have to be conservative, but we also have to use realistic numbers. And that's where a really good property manager comes in um, because you can look at comps, but somebody that really understands that market can say, no, it's going to rent for that amount, which is more than the average or less than the average, but it's a really key uh, data point and insight there, expertise is uh, is required. Uh, So if you want to talk more about investment real estate, maybe you want to buy a property as a rental, maybe you want to invest and start flipping. Uh, You've just got some money you're not entirely sure what to do with, but you want to play around in the world of real estate, give me a call. I'm happy to walk you through that and tell you what I do personally, uh, which also includes private money lending. So uh, thank you so much for joining the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA. You guys enjoy the rest of your weekend and Godspeed. Join us for another edition of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show next Saturday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 10. Find him online at listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. Or call him at 843-800-0065. That's 843-800-0065.